Mothers, of course, serve many roles in our lives, right? Our mothers are teachers. They're disciplinarians, although sometimes that's just wait till your father gets home discipline. But either way, it works. Our, our mothers serve as cleaning ladies. Our, our mothers, some of them serve as gardeners and, and mowers of the lawn. And, and most mothers, I think, at least understand the importance that it's more important to bake cookies than it is to wash windows, right? You've got to do both, but those cookies are important. Now, mothers are our nurses and our doctors and our psychologists and our counselors and our, they're our chauffeurs, right? Um, think of the miles that moms drive and there are coaches and, and all these great things. And mothers are, are the ones who help us develop our personalities and they mold our vocabularies, right? And they, they help shape our attitudes about life. And, and then they're also there, the mothers are there as soft voices in our lives saying, I, I love you, child. And, and our mothers are, are there as an as a early link to God for us. Our, our mothers often serve as our first impression of God's love. And mothers are all of these things, of course, and so, so, so much more, right? Mothers are the important women in our lives. And if you are an important woman in our lives, you are a legacy maker. And ladies, motherhood is not limited by biology, so don't worry about that. There's, there's so much more to mothering than it is just to biology. So there are many women in my life who are not my biological mother who are nonetheless mothers to me. And thank you, ladies, for that. Many of you will know the name of Irma Bombeck. She tells a story, a story of God in the act of creating mothers. Anybody ever heard this story? No? Good, because I'm going to tell it to you. So she tells a story about God creating the first mother. You see, he was working and working and working, and, and he'd already worked a long day, and it was, I mean, it was heading like towards overtime. And, and so an angel said to God, he said, Lord, man, you're spending an awful lot of time on this one, aren't you? The Lord nodded his head and turned, and he said, Have you read the specs on this model? You see, she is, she is supposed to be completely washable, right? But she can't be plastic. She is to have 180 different moving parts, but all of them replaceable. And she's supposed to have this kiss, right? This, this kiss that will heal everything from a, from a broken arm to a, a broken heart. And then this model calls for a lap that will disappear whenever she stands up. And not only that... She's got to be able to function on black coffee and leftovers. And then she's supposed to have six pair of hands. The angel looked at the Lord and said, six pair of hands? That's impossible, God. The Lord looked back at the angel and said, it's not the six pair of hands that bother me. It's the three pair of eyes. You see, she's supposed to have that, that, that special pair of eyes that can see through closed doors, so whenever she says, what are you kids doing in there, she already knows. And then she's got to have that other set of eyes in the back of her head, right? So that she's never surprised. She can always see what's going on. Then, of course, she has to have that third set of eyes on the front, that special set of eyes that can look at a child that just goofed up and communicate love and understanding without saying a single word. The angel shook his head and said, Oh, Lord, that's, that's too much. You can't put that much in one model, Lord. God, uh, why don't you rest for a little while? Why don't, go finish this job tomorrow, right? No, I can't, said the Lord. I'm close to creating someone who's very much like myself. And I've already come up with a model who can heal herself when she's sick, who can feed a whole family of six on a pound of hamburger, and who can persuade a nine-year-old to take a shower. Uh, the angel looked at the model of motherhood a little more closely and said, Lord, she's too soft. Oh, but she's tough, said the Lord. You'd be surprised at how much a mother can do. Can she think, said the angel? Not only can she think, said the Lord, but she can reason, she can compromise, and she can persuade. And the angel reached over and just touched her cheek. I said, Lord, this one's got a leak. I told you you couldn't fit that much into one model. 
God looked at him and said, that's not a leak, that's a tear. Well, what's a tear for, Lord? Well, God responded and said, a tear is for joy. A tear is for sadness. A tear is for sorrow, for disappointment, and for pride as well. That's an amazing piece of work, Lord. Indeed it is, he said. And he finished it with a smile. Maybe with all of that in mind, we can better understand from the story today, Mrs. Zebedee. Mrs. Zebedee was the mother to James and John. And if you want to follow along, I mentioned earlier, we're going to be in Matthew 20, 20 through 23. You're welcome to use your iPhones, iPads, Androids. There's Bibles in the seats in front of you. If you don't own a Bible, there's Bibles on the Welcome Center that you are welcome to take. Those are Bibles that we give away. And we're going to be in Matthew 20, 20 through 23. And I'll read that to you. There it says, Then the mother of Zebedee's sons came to Jesus with her sons, and kneeling down, asked a favor of him. What is it you want? he said. She said, Grant that one of these two sons of mine may sit at your right, and the other may sit at your left hand in your kingdom. Jesus responded, You don't know what you're asking. Can you... Drink the cup that I am going to drink. We can, they answered. And Jesus said to them, You will indeed drink from my cup, but to sit at my right or sit at my left is not for me to grant. These places belong to those for whom they have been prepared for by my Father. Now, as we hear this story, we we need to understand that Mrs. Zebedee was aware of the teachings of Jesus about his kingdom. And she was also very, very aware of the fact that her two sons, James and John, were very, very close to Jesus. You see, James and John were two-thirds of the inner circle of Peter, James, and John, right? The guys who were closest to Jesus. So she was certain that when the Lord would form his kingdom, that they would have positions of responsibility and authority. But you see... If you read back a little earlier in Matthew 20, in the same chapter there, Jesus told a story that might have disturbed her a little bit. Let me share that with you, and maybe you'll understand. The story in the Bible right before the set of verses I just read to you is a story about a landowner. And and this landowner, he goes out to find some laborers early in the morning. He gets this man to work for him. They agree upon a, a price for the work for the day. And he sets about working. And then at noon, he goes and, and finds some more help, right? They agree to a price for the work for the day, and he joins the workforce. And then not too long, actually, before the end of the workday, this guy goes out and gets another worker, brings him on. They agreed to a price, brings him on, gets him to work. Well, when the day ends, and these men who had been hired for the day come to receive their pay, The man pulls out his wallet or where he keeps his money and he pays them off. To the man who started early in the morning and the the man who came at lunch and the man who came like just, you know, a half hour before closing time, he, he pays them the exact same amount, right? Now the story must have caused Mrs. Zebedee to wonder Will then will my sons have positions of authority in the Lord's kingdom? I mean, they got on board early on, right? What does this mean for them? So when the opportunity presented itself for her to come to Jesus and she comes to the Lord, Matthew says that she bows down before him and she makes this request. When you establish your kingdom, Jesus, I would just request that You take one of my boys and seat him on your right, the right hand, a position of power, right? And then take my other son. Don't forget about him. He's he's one of your inner circle. Put him over over on, on the left side of you, right? Will you find a place for both my sons, a place of honor, a place of authority? That's what she asks of Jesus. Now, as we read the story, it would be easy to then criticize Mrs. Zebedee for the audacious presumptuousness of her request, right? Who are you to be asking this of Jesus? Right? 
But I think since today's Mother's Day, we might take a different track, and we ought to think for a few minutes about the positive things that Mrs. Zebedee does here. We need to recognize that while she comes to Jesus, and while Jesus doesn't necessarily grant her request, he also never denies her request, right? He simply reminds her of the cost of being seated at his right or at his left, and then tells her that it's his father who will determine who will be seated there. So what are some of the good things about Mrs. Zebedee from this story? First of all, she comes to the Lord, it says, praying that her sons might be part of his kingdom. And I can think of no more important task of motherhood than that, to to seek to ensure that the children in your life are part of God's kingdom. Now, I know that mothers generally are women of prayer. Sometimes you just pray out of necessity, right? Sometimes they pray because motherhood's not easy, right? Sometimes prayer is the only thing you've got left if you're a mom. James Dobson tells a story about that. A story how he came home one day when his son Ryan was young, small little baby yet. Now Ryan's, of course, growing up, so this is 30 years past. But James Dobson comes home, and it had been a terrible day for his wife, he says. His son Ryan, you see, he'd been a sick little guy all day long. Miserably sick child. Just crying, whimpering and whining. Just, oh, you know, how that breaks your heart to see your little one suffering. And not only had he been sick, but at one point during the day, she, she was changing his diaper and the phone rang and, and she turned her head and grabbed the telephone. And as she did this, she had not yet fastened his diaper and he had a bout of diarrhea at that moment. And if you're a parent, you know what that is like. So she cleaned up the mess yet again and made him all clean and sweet-smelling and put yet another set of clothes on the child, took him up into the living room and fed him. Now as she was burping him, he threw up all over himself and all over her. Got it on the couch too, the story says. That projectile baby vomit. Dobson writes, when I got home that day, when I opened the door, I could smell the aroma of motherhood. It was everywhere. And he said, as my wife heard the door open, her name's Shirley, he said, as Shirley heard the door open, she cried out to me, was any of this in my contract? Right? Right? Sometimes mothers just pray out of frustration. And sometimes in the frustration of trying to teach our children, we realize the difficulties that God has given us to communicate and do so much for them. There's a man named Steve once who wanted to give his son his first responsibility. So Steve tells his son to watch their new baby, Susan. Watch your baby sister. And he stepped out of the room for just a moment. And he had only been gone for just a moment, Steve had, when he heard a thump. And then Susan started crying. He rushed back into the room, see, sees Susan having fallen off the couch onto the floor, stretched out on the floor, bawling her eyes out. And Steve, meanwhile, looks down at his son. And he says... I told you to watch her. The little boy looked up at him with innocent eyes and said, I did. I watched her fall and I watched her cry. (laughs) Right? He did exactly what he was told to do. Mom would have given better instructions. Being a parent isn't easy, though. Sometimes it's filled with joy. Sometimes it's, it's filled with sadness, frustration. Sometimes your children make you so proud, you feel like your chest is going to burst, right? You can barely hold it in. And other times, there just aren't enough handkerchiefs to dry your tears. But as we hear in the story, Mrs. Zebedee praying for her boys, 
what good is it for us as parents if our children are, are successful and they make all the money in the world and they have the finest cars and the biggest houses and, and all these great things, but they don't know God? What does it matter if they gain the whole world, but they lose their souls? Being a parent isn't easy. And I speak firsthand, it's difficult at times. But Mrs. Zebedee gives a, a very valuable lesson here. A very valuable example for us. Because she comes to Jesus with her request, but she comes praying that her sons would be included in God's kingdom. You see, we need to have this very same concern for the children in our lives, all of us. And I hope that the heart of every adult in the room hearing my voice today, that that in our hearts we share this burden, that we go before the throne of God and we pray for those children that God has entrusted us with, that God has placed in our lives. We, We go to God praying as this mother prayed that they too would be part of God's kingdom. That every child that you have influence over, pray that they would be saved. And that they would know Christ as Lord, as Savior, and as King. And that they would put their hope and trust in Him and Him alone for eternal life. And that for your part in the process, you would pray and live in such a way that would point them in that direction. Mrs. Zebedee shows us the place to begin. And then second, not only does she pray for her children that they be part of the kingdom, but hear this she prays that they would be actively involved in the work of God's kingdom. You see, maybe it's not just enough to, to barely cross the finish line, right? Maybe, maybe we should aspire to more than just having our kids get saved. There's lots of churches in this world filled with lots of people who just barely do enough. You get the minimum requirements, you got the golden ticket, you're going to heaven, you punch the clock and... You're done, right? You sit back in the pew, you enjoy the show, and then you leave. There's lots of people in the world like that. Thankfully, we don't have a whole lot of folks like that, but there are people in this world that are like that. And here, Mrs. Zebedee prays that her boys would have an active, involved role in the kingdom of God. That they would be servants. But where does the spirit of service begin? Well, it begins at home. It begins at home with mothers and fathers and aunts and uncles and family friends setting the example and praying that their children would be involved in the work of the kingdom and then showing the way as teachers, as leaders, as disciple makers that that they would help these children grow into people who would go out into the world that would be people who would go out and seek and save the lost, right? That people who would grow up and continue the church and to be part of the cornerstone and the fabric and the foundation of our culture in our community until Jesus comes again. That is what Mrs. Zebedee was praying for, that her boys, her children, would be involved in the work of Jesus' kingdom. And we too should all, as adults, walk in her same footsteps. The third thing that we see here from Mrs. Zebedee is that she had big expectations for her sons, right? Big expectations. She didn't just pray that her children would be doorkeepers, although we need those. But she wanted her boys to be at the right hand and the left hand of Jesus. I mean, when you're working in the kingdom of God, there's no greater place to be than on the right hand and the left hand of the king. And that's what she wants for her sons. I mean, we might consider Mrs. Zebedee a a bit presumptuous, but I admire her boldness, frankly. Too often, too often we settle for mediocrity. Too often we settle for the minimum. Far too often, we're simply content to let things happen and to watch others make those things happen and then wonder why we got left behind or got left out. If we want to transform our world, if we, if we want to transform our community, if we want to transform our neighborhoods, if, if we want to transform our families, that low standard has to change. We have to take hold of the expectations 
believe that, perhaps we could aspire to be at the right hand or left hand, that we might be leaders, that we might have the opportunity to mold and fashion and, and, and outreach to others, that we might be the ones mobilizing and going into the world, making disciples of all nations, taking the message of Christ with us wherever we might go, that we could be the ones striving for excellence to reach others and do our very best for the Lord. See, the Lord calls us to be His disciples. We have to choose to be effective leaders. We have to choose to be active laborers in His kingdom. Remember that story I was telling you about Irma Bombeck talking about God creating a mother? He says, I'm close to creating something like myself. I suppose that's why today is so special. Because we recognize that a mother's love is probably the closest example we will see here on earth to God's love. A love that goes all the way down through the valley of the shadow of death with us as we travel that trail. It is a a love that sacrifices like no other. A love that would lay itself down for each and every one of her brood. Again, and again. I'll close with a story here. The story is told, comes out of World War II, out of the Holocaust, actually, that took millions of people's lives. And it's a story of Solomon Rosenberg and his family. It's a true story. Solomon Rosenberg and his wife and their two sons and his mother and father were arrested and placed into a Nazi concentration camp. And this was one of the camps that was a labor camp. And in a labor camp, the rules were simple. As long as you could work, you were permitted to live. That's all there was. Nice and easy. But if you became too weak to do your work, they would replace you and you would be exterminated. Rosenberg watched his mother and father marched off to their deaths. And he knew, sadly, that next would be his youngest son, David. Because David had always been a frail child. And every evening, the Rosenbergs would come back together into the barracks after his hours of labor. And then he would search for the faces of his family. And when he found them, they would, they would huddle together and embrace one another and, and sing and, and shout praises to the Lord for another day of life together. Well, one day, Rosenberg came back and he didn't see those familiar faces. And he searched and he searched. And finally, he discovered his oldest son, Joshua, huddled in a corner, weeping and praying. And he said, Josh, tell me it's not true. Joshua turned around. He said, it's true, Papa. Today, David wasn't strong enough to do his work, and so they came for him. But where is your mother, he said. Where is your mother? Oh, Papa, he says. When they came for David, he was so afraid. And so he began to cry. So Mama took his hand, and she went off with him. That's what we're talking about. Simple, powerful sacrifice. All of us have an opportunity to leave a great legacy. It's never too late to start. Ladies, today is your day. And we thank so many of you for doing so much for us. For giving so much for us. Selflessly showing us the love of God through your service, through your sacrifice, through your actions, day after day after day. We are better for it. Our world is better for it. And so we thank you. We thank you for being who God created you to be. We thank you for leading the way that we might see God in you. We thank you for every sacrifice you make on our behalf. And always remember that you were designed with a purpose in mind 
that if you devote yourself to more than yourself, you will ultimately have more than yourself to show for it. May God bless you today, especially ladies and everyone as well who hears my voice. Happy Mother's Day to all of you women. Amen. Let's pray.